yeah so um first of all i want to say it was really my pleasure and i so so enjoyed this interview i don't think like the questions many things you've asked i don't think i've ever been asked those things and i love i love that i love when it's like new questions and things i haven't been asked before hello everybody and welcome to this episode of thinking aloud um, today's guest is a parenting coach and child advocate that has uh, 160,000 followers now on Instagram and I'm usually not the type to appreciate all the all the parenting coaches that my wife sends me but Blimey Heller is uh, somebody who seems to have been able to communicate to me in a way that I don't reject immediately and yeah welcome Blimey how are you? Thank you so much for having me on. I'm good. And actually, I couldn't believe you were like right on the mark with 160,000 followers. You're really up to date here. <laughs> That's a very recent development. Um, yeah. And I really appreciate you saying that, you know, what I share somehow in some way is able to reach you. Yeah, it's uh, I my wife definitely follows a lot. I follow a few um, parenting coaches. My personal favorite parenting coach is is Jordan Peterson, um, which I know you do not love his his parenting philosophies. But I, I do think there is less of a difference between what you say and what he says than I think uh, you than than I think uh, and I yeah than you think there is because I, I know like obviously the clips out of context but when you read his book and you listen to him talk and you listen to what he's really communicating um, I I mean he's advocating both for parents and for kids but I mean he has. On the one hand, uh, don't let your kids do anything that makes you dislike them. And people have a really hard time with that phrasing because I think they confuse that with don't let your kids do anything that you don't like. Uh, and I, that's a different statement because your kids are going to do lots of things mm -hmm. that you don't like. But if there's something that makes you dislike them, then uh, first off, that's not a really good long-term solution for um, being a parent. But it's also... And this is a point Jordan Peterson makes. If you, the parent who loves them more than anybody in the entire world, doesn't like them, um, you're not really doing them much of a favor sending them out into the world where the people around them will also most likely not like them if if that bother, if it makes you not like them. So what do you think about that? Yeah, so I was going to say, I, I, I definitely hear the value in that. And I, I somewhat agree. My challenge with it actually is more the beginning part of the statement which is don't let your children and i have a few issues with that which is first of all like what does it mean not to let like i cannot let my child from here to canarsie like they're still going to do certain things right especially when they're very young and that's my other challenge is that young children do act in many 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 ways that make uh, like that is not likable meaning young children are very primitive i guess in a way because their brain still is right not fully developed and they're very like uncivilized and they act in ways that sometimes are very and, and that's just the nature of childhood so i think it can get very tricky when parents hear like don't let your children do anything you don't like and then the children do things because they're children and it's like and then we panic about oh my gosh people are not going to like them and then i worry about how the parents going to respond to that so i worry about it on that level and i also worry about like so what measures are we then using to make sure our children don't do things we don't like and that's also tricky territory for me. Like, I really don't, I think that sometimes that very easily goes into like harsh and punitive kind of measures because we're like, if I can't let them, it's like a very scary, like the whole statement of like, I cannot let, right? You know, is, 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 um, it's like, how do we control another human to not let them do something? It's just, it, and it, it automatically, for me in my mind, I imagine controlling tactics which I'm not for. Right. I mean, you're not for controlling tactics even for a two-year-old and a three-year-old who you can control and not let them do things, even physically, just the ability to pick them up and move right. them well, to a different I mean, room. or. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it depends, I guess, what you mean by control. I mean, I mean, when I say, like, to step in and stop them, for sure. I'm, a, you know, protective use of force, you know. Um, I, I'm, I am fully on board with that, but I'm not into control as in, like, trying to control what they're going to do. Um, like, uh, um, I don't know how to say this, like in, 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 let's say like making a child afraid to do something. So in that way, like, you know, you're, you're not letting them or whatever, that kind of control where like, let's say, you know, and they think about populations, uh, what are they called? Um, now it, it escapes my mind. Um, not what's the opposite of a democracy? Like, uh, 
dictatorship. dictatorship. Yeah. yeah. And dictatorships, how do they control the population through fear? Right. If you do this and we'll kill you or whatever it is, or we'll take your everything away from you. And so that's what I think of when I think of control, like using tactics to sort of, you know, manipulate people's behaviors through fear. And so that's where I worry parents will go to when they hear those kinds of statements. So let's say um, both my wife and I, not just me, but both my wife and I find a particular behavior uh, disturbing and extremely bothersome. Uh, what? And it's not just me and my wife doesn't find it bothersome. Like we both find it bothersome. So it's a fair, uh, I'd say a fair measure to assume that it's something that's actually bothersome. I'm not just delusional. What steps could one take that are not uh, fear tactics in order to guide or facilitate the child towards more communal, uh, likable behavior? Yeah, so so here's the thing for me. Sorry, I heard my phone. I'm sorry. It's I'm gonna just put on silence. Okay, for for me, um, see, it's it's not a and, and this is where like why for me it's so important to have a, like a background of so much information, like development, child development, how children learn, because it's not there's no quick fixes in parenting. It's not like oh I see a behavior I don't like or that is not likable and will make my child not likable, and so like let's find a quick way to get rid of it so that my child never does it again. For me, it's like we have to look at the bigger picture here and understand it in its context. Like the child's acting like that because developmentally they have struggle with impulse control and also they don't have better ideas. So for me, the way to do that is to first of all, recognize that it's going to take repetition and practice and it's a slow process. And also the other thing is to teach them. So to guide them. So let's say a child, I don't know, you want to give me an example of a behavior that you find? I mean, there's I can think of many, but um, they, both you and your wife find, you know, that you don't like not that you don't like that you find makes her unlikable um exactly yeah I, this is a bad one but um for me I, it's the particular use of whining in order to communicate anything that mm-hmm. whining tone i mean i'm a particularly uh sensitive person mm-hmm. auditorily uh, like when it comes to audio processing and that tone of voice of yeah. whining is particularly annoying and i find it annoying in all kids uh but like that whine even when you don't need yeah, to whine. Yeah, it's very irritating yeah yeah oh my gosh i really 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 get that i i remember that stage with my kids it was see when that's the thing this is such i'm actually so happy you brought this example because if we understood child development we would know that most of the majority of children move through that stage it's a stage and then they move past that and they stop whining for every little thing and they don't talk like that but if we believe, if we don't understand child development and if we don't know that that's going to happen, we think, oh, I need to nip this in the bud. I need to get rid of this behavior. Otherwise, they're going to whine forever and ever and ever. And then I see, and this, I used to do this too, but I see parents all the time like doing things like, if you're going to whine, you have to go to your room. If you're going to whine, I can't give you what you want. If you're going to whine, and it's just like all these things that I find are so unnecessary and not only unnecessary because it was one thing if it was unnecessary. It's also, I think like it hurts the child. It hurts the child because like they're just a helpless human who doesn't know how to communicate differently. They've just graduated from crying to talking a little bit. And just because they've now are able to speak rather than cry, we expect them to just be like, you know, always speak when you need something in the most mature way and ask for it. You know, you don't need to whine. It's like they're not there yet. They're really not there yet. And um, so I think that it's just asking too much of a child. And and that's my worry with all these things, with this kind of advice to parents. I I just don't think it's like informed enough with like development. Um, and that's why, like, for me, I prefer, like, people who are developmental psychologists, like Dr. Gordon Newfield, who is also Canadian. What is, what's a piece of, what's your favorite piece of wisdom you've received from Dr. Newfield? Ooh, I have so many. Oh, so much of what, like, my, you know, parenting approach is influenced by his, his, you know, work. Um, huh. Just the first, you don't even have to pick a favorite. Just the first thing that comes to your mind. The first thing that comes to my mind, I think, is that, and I think this was because it like was very profound for me when I first heard, first heard it, was that um, children don't experience your intentions no matter how heartfelt. They experience, these are, I think this is a direct quote from him. They experience, um, ooh, now I've, now, now the second part I'm butchering, but 
what you manifest in tone and behavior. So he means to say, like, you can love your children to death, right? And your child still can experience, have an experience of, like, you don't love me. They can still be, have that because they don't experience your intentions. They experience what you actually, how you engage with them. They experience your behavior, like how you speak to them, how you talk to them. And if the message that they get through your tone and behavior is that, like, you know, you're annoying, I don't like you, get away from me, um, or like you're so irritating, or, um, you know, your behaviors, uh, your feelings are unacceptable to me, or whatever, then that's what their experience will be. Um, just off of that, with, uh, if we take out the, your feelings are unacceptable to me, that element of it. But if like my kid annoys me and I am annoyed and I respond in an annoyed way, wouldn't my kid learn just like, oh, I don't want to annoy my dad. So I'm not going to like, I don't like that response so I can avoid that. And that would be in theory, a way, a natural way for the kid to develop, to not produce that behavior like uh, wouldn't that work yeah like or wouldn't that just yeah. be like we don't have to try to change ourselves so much just you're being a parent and you're gonna be if your kid's annoying and you're annoyed then your kid will learn and maybe they'll be less annoying what do you yeah what do you yeah yeah no i totally hear you. you're basically saying like can, can, can we just be human and if we're human our children will learn what they need to learn through that like if they do something annoying we feel annoyed and so then they're going to learn that like oh like I shouldn't be, I, I probably shouldn't do that. Cause that's right. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. Instead of being this like parent who's like always like totally fine with whatever their children do. And it's like, never show any annoyance. Right. Is that what yeah, I, I, I just have, I mean, I see it in real life, but also just the caricature of like the mom who's just like, Oh, okay. And just everything is cool. And like, there's a certain calm tone of voice, but like their body is as anxious as you could possibly imagine, you know, they're being driven crazy and they're still just like so calm. And to me, I just get this inauthentic, uh, fake, like hippie vibe that I feel like a kid would pick up on rather quickly and be counterproductive. Yeah, you're spot on. You're spot on. And I think that this is the downside of this whole like gentle parenting movement. There's there's always downsides to every single one, right? And, and I think that that's one of them is that some parents understand it to mean exactly that it's like don't show any of your actual natural emotions and um be inauthentic and just always be okay with everything kind of thing and it ends up being a really i think um hurtful to both parent and child and so yeah i'm i'm uh, really fully on board with being authentic and here's where i i guess i differ or where, where where i would like put in like a little bit of the you know you're like oh if i feel annoyed that my child is sees that i'm annoyed and then they won't do it again which i i actually do think there's a lot of value to them seeing like the impact of their actions, meaning, yeah, when I do that, my parent gets angry, right? And so for them to understand that, of course, they have an impact. Their behaviors are not just like, oh, like can never impact their parent. Their parent's not like some sort of like wall of stone. Um, also, besides for the fact that like the parent isn't. And so like you said, that if they're fake, the children can see right through that. The children, children actually are much less about words. They're much more about the feeling. So they actually experience what the parent is feeling much more than they do their words. Um, so aside for the, for the fact that our children will pick it up anyway, um, the only thing that I, I, for me is really important is that the parent has the consciousness that my child didn't, my child isn't at fault for me feeling annoyed, right? They're not to, to blame for it. This, these feelings are mine and they came up in me in response to what my child did. And it's okay for my child to even know that, but my child isn't. It's not their, first of all, it's not their responsibility to fix my feelings or to change my feelings or whatever. Um, but also, well, really basically that. They're not responsible to, to to save me from it or to make it better for me. And that's where the territory gets really tricky because sometimes children can feel like they are responsible to make it go away or or whatever. We don't want children to also walk on eggshells around their parents. So it's like we have to find this sort of balance of, yeah, it's okay to be human and to express our humanity to our children while at the same time, them knowing very clearly that they're not responsible for us in any in any way and that we can handle being annoyed like it's not going to shake our relationship that's another huge thing and that's what dr gordon newfield talks about meaning he says like yeah sure the children will behave in ways that are you know not okay or whatever and we will get upset or angry he says and that and, and what what we need to make is that the relationship is greater than that 
what we need to give our child a sense is that the relate my relationship with you my connection with you is greater than any of those things so that's so and sometimes what happens is when a parent's annoyed and they express their annoyance this the parent says it in a way or whatever and the child perceives i am annoying versus my behavior was annoying and i am okay with my parents like we're okay our relationship is good it's just that my behavior right now wasn't right annoying. Yeah, I, I hear the distinction. I mean, I tr I definitely like the idea of I'm triggered. Like a trigger is no one can trigger me, but I have my, like I have things that biologically make me triggered. So it's not you who did it; it's me. But nonetheless, I I'm hungry. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm tired, and I don't have the patience to deal with you right now. Is uh, I don't have the patience to deal with this right now. That leading into, I have this. Uh, like almost slight disagreement with my wife where I'll get like, let's say I, I'm, I'm a little quicker, a little hotter tempered, definitely hotter tempered than my wife is, um, maybe even hotter tempered than most are. Uh, and I have this like, no, it's better for me to almost get in the fight with my four and a half year old and stay there and like, okay, there's, I, I'll yell and then I'll be like, my apologies like i'm sorry i didn't it's not your fault that i yelled but just like please stop yelling i got a crazy migraine or whatever it is versus my wife she says okay you should just yelling is never okay it shouldn't there should never be any outward expression of rage or anger get up and leave and my my position was like that almost seems worse like that i'm leaving like leaving the situation like this is too much for me to handle so i'm going away uh and yeah, whose side of the argument are you on? I'm actually, it's very interesting. I'm actually on both sides of the argument, meaning I actually think it has more to do with the individual who it's being done to or who the other individual in the interaction, meaning your child in this situation, right? So I think it has more to do with your child than with you. Like, you're right. I think some children would prefer if their parent stays there and is angry, but is just like, and the child is, is not too scared of it. And the child feels like they can communicate with the parents. And it, yeah, and, and they would prefer that. And some children would be like, absolutely never, ever, ever yell at me. I'd much rather you go to your room. And so now again, a four-year-old sometimes can't communicate that. So it takes a little bit of attunement to see how our child is. Um, I see even with my children. Yeah, one's much more okay with anger. The other one is terrified of anger. So it's really like uh, you have to be attuned to your child and see. And I think it works the same way with adults. Like I know adults in relationships, some of them are like, yeah, please yell at me, be upset. And some are like, no. You go like deal with your anger on your own and then come to me when you're more calm and talk to me about it. So it's really, I think, a matter of the uh, the, uh, the child and how they perceive it. That's that was awesome. my answer. Yeah. my The other night, I was like, uh, my wife was out of town and I in she had the baby and I just had my daughter and we had like a really nice evening and, and really nice dinner. And then I spent an extra 45 minutes with her afterwards and it's time for bed. And then I've already spent all this time. I've already spent all this extra effort. I already spent all this tension. Now we're like an hour past bedtime and okay, let's go to bed reasonably. And she just started to whine and complain about something. And I went from calm to like raged to like, I am, I got to take a break and I got to leave the room and calm down. And so I said to her, and then I came back in the room and I said, I still wasn't calm. And she said, daddy, you're not calm yet. Um, <laughs> like it was like the, the wildest moment, like daddy, you're not calm yet. I'm like, you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, uh, wow. it was, yeah, it's so it's, um, I, I definitely, I mean, I definitely push my kid to be more articulate. Like, uh, like I, I'm more inquisitive. I ask a lot of whys. I, I, we, we did, um, I think I forget what the, um, rye parenting or like, uh, does that make any sense? Respectful. I don't, yeah yeah I, yeah yes, um yes. and it was, they were big on like not talking in baby voices to kids like not speak like speak i uh, like speaking right. to a kid as much like an adult as possible and it was tremendously i mean yeah. maybe she's just a unique person and we'll find out with the next kid but it was tremendously beneficial yeah. um it's always it, yeah no that makes a lot of sense and I, I... keep going no no, 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 no. i was oh, sorry keep going yeah, so I was gonna say it's a. I think what I'm hearing here is that you really appreciate that she like is vocal and she 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 feels like she can share with you and she's like a she's like a valuable equal member in the relationship where she can say you're not calm and you will be like you're right and you'll leave 
And I think that get, that actually gives children a great sense of safety if they know that they can vocalize what's going on for them or what they don't appreciate and that the parent will listen. And that's huge. And in, in, in a relationship where they feel that, I think they're much more likely to be okay with like the parent's expression of anger because they feel like they have choice and they have a voice and that they can care for themselves in that, you know, and the parent will also care for them in that. I also want to be clear about when I say about yelling, even though I think like, yeah, I say it's particular to the child and whatever, and some children are, can handle like the, you know, when I say yelling, I mean, to, I'm talking purely about tone of voice. I think that certain things are never okay to say to a child, really anyone, but um, certain things are just like, you know, especially children who are so egocentric, um, meaning they can never look at things and be like, oh, that's my parents' issue. It's not mine. Um, they have a very hard time and everything they take, they just absorb like, oh, it must be something about me. And so if we were use language like you are this or you are that, they they will most almost definitely adopt that and believe that about themselves. It can be terribly hurtful to them. And so I think that yeah, so I just wanted to be clarify what I mean when I say that I'm okay with yelling. If the child's okay with that, I'm talking about, you know, an angry tone, expressing that anger, um, not using language that is hurtful. Right. Yeah, I'm I'm very sensitive to that. I mean, I definitely grew up, uh, <laughs> whether it was teachers or parents, uh, with a little extra, I think you give your dog a name, eventually he'll answer to it. So that's a, a line that resonates with me. So if you continue to call a kid annoying or a bad kid or a pain in the ass, whatever we're going to call them. It's yeah, definitely something to avoid, but I, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to never get angry. Um, but that, that being said, this, when we spent, I, I, people sell people who are interested in being better parents and developing themselves, not just as parents, but as more wholesome people. And in a world now where, we're obs almost obsessed with healing and this healing and everybody's healing and we can do anything we need to heal. And it, and my feeling or is that we spend so much time, like I can, I'm a, I know everything that I should be doing, everything that I could be doing, but in the end of the day, just because I know what doesn't mean I know how. And often there's this guilt and shame um, between the cognitive dissonance between what I know and what I actually do. And I see it even like, I mean, we're getting better at it in our relationship, but I see like all this wisdom and all this knowledge of how to parent and how to be a better parent. I'm afraid of the flip side, which is parents who are more depressed, more anxious, more guilty than they've been in history because parents are like, no, I'm a parent. I'm doing what I do. And this is what I did. And, and I'm wondering, have you seen in your experience with parents, uh, the negative elements of having too much information? Absolutely. 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 I see it all the time. I think when I first started out, I was not nearly sensitive enough to it. I did not realize um, this possible impact, but I see it really does. Like people, parent, exactly what you said, there's a ton of shame and guilt. Like you said, parents are almost like feeling more hopeless about their ability to parent and more like, oh my gosh, I'm doing this all wrong. I'm a terrible parent. Maybe I'm not, not the right parent for my child. This is very common thoughts that parents have, and it's really not helpful. And um, I, I completely hear you. Like it, it's sort of we were trying we were trying to say, like, this is not helpful to kids. This is not helpful to kids. Maybe we should shift and change things. But there is a downside. Another one <laughs> where parents that can become consumed by shame and guilt and hopelessness. And, you know, so um, for me, the solution is not to stop sharing information. I think it's for, first of all, for every person to be very aware of themselves and to notice maybe I, I should stop consuming so much information. Yeah, so I was saying that, that I think there's two things. First is I really want to urge parents to like check in with themselves. And if they find like I'm taking like I'm feeling horrible all the time when I'm taking this information, stop taking in information. It's not helping. It's not good for you. Maybe take a different route. Maybe just take a break. And I honestly really believe that the more a parent works on themselves, like you said, becomes more whole within themselves, really the better parent they're going to be. It's not really about taking in all this like random information from people. Um, you know, so I think that maybe going for, you know, self-help or therapy or whatever, or just taking a break. But also, I think for parenting coaches, I think that I I really think that we need to or it would really help if we included a lot of like compassion for parents and we're really careful about recognizing what we share might bring up in parents. And I have started being much more cognizant of that and recognizing like, yeah, this might bring up a lot of shame. This might bring up a lot of guilt. This might bring a lot of like worry. And so I, I try to hold I try to acknowledge that. And also find a way to like soothe parents, I guess, you know, in some way, like so that they can take in information without that heaviness. Right. Yeah. 
Um, and I was, I mean, this is um, a d little different of a question, but still along the same note, if like, there's lots of parenting courses out there and lots of parenting coaches out there. And my theory is if somebody were to just go to therapy for themselves and just be seeing a therapist and getting themselves as healthy and balanced and even killed as possible, uh, that would be a, an inv a better investment. Let's say you had whatever, $500 a month to spend on therapy. It would better go towards personal therapy than to parenting therapy. Uh, mm. Yeah. I'm, in, yeah I'm, I'm listening. Yeah. Is that, is, I mean, obviously you're a parenting coach, so this might be a little negative uh, against your model, but uh, it, to, to me, that's like, this i mean a lot of it like also it's not just with parenting coach i think like uh people go to marriage their counselors a lot and it's like what's the the biggest corollary between is to divorce the biggest cause of divorce is mar is marriage counseling uh, i have one of those beliefs but this but then on the other hand yeah I'm, yeah i just i don't know if that was a question more than an observation but yeah. do you like okay i'll um, Oh, that's a different question, a little differently. As a parenting coach and somebody who knows so much, but I also know that you're still human, which means you still mess up as a parent. Do you feel like an extra pressure as a coach to be uh, have a certain persona, a certain amount of perfection that weighs on you personally? Yeah, definitely. I've definitely, definitely felt that. And I think I still do feel that if I'm honest. Um, I wish I didn't, but um, I, one of my one of my paths to whole, wholeness is to be fully honest um, with all parts of myself. I think sometimes, you know, the shadow self people talk about, we try to like hide it and pretend that it doesn't exist and it's not there. And I'm really trying to embrace the shadow and be like, no, actually I have, and I have, I do have that part of me definitely. So um, yeah, but I'm, I'm really trying more and more to sort of um, share my imperfections and, um, yeah, of course I'm human. Like it's just it's a it's a it's a joke to think that I I somehow have figured this out because like I share this information. It's just that I'm super passionate about it and really try to live by its values. But of course I don't all the time. Um, so and of course I'm a serious work in progress. But I I actually really want to just comment on what you said about like the the first of all marriage coaching. Oh my gosh, that's a whole. I mean marriage counseling. That's a whole separate conversation that I also have so much to say about. But I. I hear you about like you're saying it's a better investment of your money to go for self-help than to go for parenting help. And I think that I really hear what you're saying. And in many ways, I actually say the same. In many ways, I tell parents, yeah, like I think that's a great investment to work on yourself because inevitably that will spill over into your parenting. And I also see from my own experience that for me, specifically getting parenting guidance was very helpful to me, meaning I also went for therapy all the time. But for specific, the parenting guidance had a specific, um, was specifically impactful and helpful for me in a sense that it was very specific to see, even though I heal, I was like, you know, healing because I hit the word healed, but okay, you know, whatever, becoming more whole, <laughs> trying to integrate my parts. Um, I, I still wasn't sure how to navigate certain scenarios because the only example I had ever seen was, you know, my parents or my friend's parents or how my friends were doing it. And so what the parenting coaching helped me was to recognize, oh, that's the way I can do it. That's the way that I can navigate it. Like it just opened my eyes to many different possibilities, to all the different strategies that are available to me as a parent. You understand? And so that's really what I try to do yeah. in my course is to really, um, well, also to, for, for all, another one is, oh, this is also huge, is that there's a lot of like, we don't realize we have like unconscious conditioning around parenting, right? We just like, from our upbringing, mm -hmm. And we don't realize we see things through a certain paradigm and we don't even realize that we do. And so in that way, parenting coaching also, I think, is impactful where it can sh it can like sort of flip the paradigm on its head and say, like, who says that's true? And I think that when you go to therapy, you don't necessarily do that, even though you do walk around yourself and maybe you'll come to those realizations on your own. But I think it's like a fast track to that. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I totally hear that. And. They always say, like, we, we are correcting the mistakes that are like our parents made right like our gender like there's a pendulum and it swing went went from one direction it's going to go to the other if you could predict what would you say in the, ne the next uh next 20 years is going to be being corrected for by parenting coaches do you yeah. do you what do you forecast 
yeah, like my children, let's say like my children's generation, like what are they going to, yeah, how, what are they, they're probably going to be, come back to like a lot more balance. Like, you know how we spoke about before about how like the parent not showing any emotion, the parent being inauthentic because we're trying so hard to like care for the parents' needs, children's needs. I think it's going to come back more where they're going to advocate, even though now it's already starting to shift more, um, advocate much more for like, let's just be authentic. Let's be real. Like there's room for a parent too. Um, a parent's needs also matter more about how do we preserve the relationship in a way that doesn't compromise the parents or it doesn't in a way diminish the parents like authenticity. Um, I think I can imagine it being more about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it sounds about right. Um, another, qu another question uh, regarding the going back to what it's like as a coach to get up there and you're, you're preaching an ideal or sharing an ideal and, what like for me i've had this barrier of like okay getting up to speak and to share my voice because like, i'm filled with imperfections i can't talk about self-improvement or anything because the laundry list of things that have yet to be improved versus which have been improved is is infinitely greater and it almost seems like that's by definition always how it'll be but what what drew you or what gave you the confidence to finally get up and say like oh i am a parenting coach or i'm going to market myself as this and to start to share your perspective on the matter like how did you get there yeah it was a combination of two things first of all I, I definitely had that self-doubt and I was like who am I? I I have so much still that I need to work on there's so much I still don't know also and by the way being a parenting coach now for seven years like I look back at some of the things I said and I'm like I totally don't agree with them anymore and so it's also like realizing that like you're going to change and grow and so many things I'm saying today I might not agree with in 10 years you know um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it was, I had a lot of doubt and a lot of like, I, I'm not a person to speak on this, but there were two things that really gave me the confidence or the, the motivation, I guess. So first it's my passion. I, I just, I couldn't contain it anymore. Like I had, I have such a strong, I don't know. I think I was always this way. I have a very like deep place in my heart for children and children's like, yes, I call myself a child advocate. And so I just wanted to speak for children. I was like, I don't care if like I'm wrong or right or anything like, and also I, I have a fear of public speaking. People would not imagine that. They probably think that like I'm so comfortable. And I, if I ever had to speak about something like, I don't know if I was called on a spot and in public and someone asked me a question, I would turn red in the face. But when I speak publicly because my passion overrides everything. It's like, it's not about me even anymore. It's about what I want people to know. Like I just want this information to go out there. So that, that was one. And the other one is actually, I don't know if you know this quote from Marianne Williamson. Um, so yeah, I was sharing my doubts with a lot of my friends when I was thinking, considering doing this. I was like, I just want to share it. I, I couldn't contain it. Um, but I was like, but who am I or whatever? And um, I'm going to butcher her, her quote, but she says something like, you know, we sometimes have a message or we have a something that we want to share with the world and we think, who am I to do it? And she says, who are you not to? Like, you were given this so that you can do that. Like it's almost, it's, it's like she flipped it on its head. Like it's almost egoic of you to think that you shouldn't. It's like, who are you not to? Like you're not, you know, um, this is like your purpose or this is what you were, you're, you're, you're meant to do this. You're a, you're a vessel, so to speak. Um, and if you really saw yourself as a vessel, you would do it. Um, you wouldn't think, yeah. So, so that really, really spoke to me and really um, changed my perspective. And I was like, yeah, I, I actually, I, I, I agree with that. And it was inspiring to me. Yeah, I, and for me, it was honestly, I was listening to Ellie Nash's podcast. I don't know if you've heard of him, but yeah. he, he had a guest on and she said, you don't need to be perfect to inspire others. Let others be inspired by how you handle your imperfections. Yeah. Um, and then I was reading, actually yesterday, I was reading, I just got back into reading Chovos Levavos, Duties of the Heart. And in his intro, I'm in his introduction and he's like talking about his motivations for writing the book, but. He's like, who, like, as soon as he began to write the book, he's like, who am I to do this? Like, who am I? Like, my language abilities are not great enough. I don't have the mind to be able to organize. And, like, it's the greatest, most important part of the Torah that has yet to be written about. He's like, who am I? And then, yeah, his, his conclusion was, like, if everybody who aspired to perfection didn't communicate like and basically there would be nobody writing anything cuz anybody who's sensitive enough knows that they are imperfect they know that they are inadequate they know that they're not they do not measure up to the ideal that they aspire to 
And so there would be nothing written down is basically what he said. So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and write this book because I care and I'm passionate about it. And that this, there was a letter from the Blavitcher Rebbe. Uh, my, my mom was talking about, she said somebody was sent to Europe or something to I don't know, go on Shlichut. And he calls her, he's like, what should I do? He's like, open your eyes and like, and look, and basically whatever your attention grabs onto, whatever bothers you or whatever draws you in is like, that's your guiding force. Like your attention, what draws your attention is, is what we're supposed to follow. So I really like. I love that. Oh, I love both of what you said. Oh, it really touched me. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Are, are there, we first have our attention. Like we don't, we don't get to choose what our attention, I don't like what we pay attention to. It seems to guide us more than we guide it. Yeah. Um, My it happens to be, I have a mentor who always starts out. Um, I take a lot of courses with him. He always starts out his courses by saying like, please don't kid yourself. I'm not spiritual, el spiritually elevated or anything. I'm just very passionate about this. And it's something that like, I, I'm obsessed with it. And like, I really try to live by it, but I'm, I'm really not, I'm not spiritual. Like I'm not, you know, some guru or I, ha I haven't mastered anything. And um, yeah, I can say the same for myself. Yeah, I think that's why that's basically the common denominator between all the people who I treat as gurus. Uh, it's funny are the ones like the, the quickest way to my heart. And as a guru is to say that you're not a guru. Um, it's a, it's a funny, uh, <laughs> like, okay, good. Like you're a real person. Uh, I can, and it, as as soon as, but the problem is, is, I'm like, wait, is he just saying that because he knows how effective it is? Um, I have, I'm a chronic, I'm working on being more open and receptive to what other people have to. Uh, I but I like wanna, skepticism. I like it. I like it. I I'm trying to figure out what to do with it, like, because I'm like, I realizing that there, that is my, it's not something I have any interest in getting rid of. Like, it's like I get, it might get be disliked by uh, and bother some people sometimes. Um, but I guess it was the I part of me that it. It, it was the part of me that was attempted to be squished down the most as a kid. Like I was, I was, uh, I wasn't the kid. I was never indifferent. Um, I was always violently bothered by whether it was the philosophical or theological claims and about God and about, so you would see me at the table at 12 years old, arguing with like my guests and, and getting in heated debates and maybe even insulting their intelligence. Uh, but it was never, but I was always like the bad kid. I was always the, 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 like I was, that was always my, my label. Um, and I'm now working on like real, I'm realizing like, wow, like I still think of myself that way. And that's how powerful it is to be like called the bad kid and to be alienated and to be demonized. Like I, st I, I've, I still, like I recognize how internalized that message is till, till this day. Um, so that's like, uh, that's really where that that's where the work is. I remember my wife's like, okay, you got to go. It's like a year ago. You got to go to therapy because you got to work on your anger. And I'm like, if we're going to go down that route, I'm not going to some behaviorist coach in order to like teach me some breathing tactics to like not get angry. Let's go to find out why I'm getting angry. And that was uh, a roller coaster ride of a journey, but it got worse before it got better, um, which is also, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think something most people don't realize is that it will get harder before it gets easier. It will go downhill before it goes uphill. And yeah, it's something, I mean, yeah, that's why I've appreciated your messaging. Cause yeah, it's, it's clear that you care and it's clear that you are not preaching and it's very much appreciated. Um, is your audience, is your audience majority women or men? Yeah. Most well, definitely majority women. Most like, what would you say the spread is? I can look it up right now. I've looked. At, I haven't looked at it in a while, but I literally think it's like ninety-eight percent women and two percent men. <laughs> really, something like that. I can look. Instagram has like the diagnostics or whatever it's called, um, and I can check. But it's something like that. It's majority majority women, and I mean, I think that makes sense. First of all, because I'm a woman, you know, right, and also because like parenting is like I think mothers see it as so like close to their hearts whereas I, I think that fathers are actually coming on board with that much more it, it, of recent of late but um yeah i think that it's like i don't know there's they're just less inclined to think that it's like you know something that they need to look to seek uh outside support with or something i don't know 
Right. And is, do you think there's space, uh, like a demand for, like, what would a male parenting coach be like? Cause men, yeah, men, it's, it's like women who are not almost seems like they're built to be maternal. Like it, that is like, they're so obsessed and focused with being more maternal versus that a man who essentially needs to be trained to be maternal to a certain degree, uh, is like, okay, like, I'm um, like, why sh- like i'm not going to listen to some person tell me how i should act towards my kids uh we are more resistant uh yeah I when like that resistance i don't think you should tell, let anyone tell you how to do deal with your kids so i mean wh- what do you do like with uh, do you like i'm sure that there are wives often coming to you like frustrated by how yeah. like aloof their husbands are and how much yeah. they don't care and how much they don't want to listen what uh yeah what like how do you how do you recommend dealing with that oh my gosh i'm actually planning to do a course with my sister who actually is a couples mediator (laughs) that's why i have a lot of thoughts on like um couples therapy but she's actually not a therapist she's a mediator which is different and she actually well she's a specific kind of mediator um an nvc mediator to be specific which is non-violent communication by marshall rosenberg which is i'm inspired a lot by his work so is she well she's trained in it so um I actually want to do a course with her on this because there is a lot, there are a lot of parents who have this with exactly like the parent is all involved and they want it. And the, you know, the, in my, in my demographic, like it's mostly the men, the husbands who are just like not interested, not, you know, and so how to navigate that because it's very, very, very tricky. And I actually like, to me, I, I see resistance. Um, I guess I see the beauty in resistance. I think that there's always something really important underneath resistance. And so that's why I said before, like, I like the resistance. I'm like, I think there's a really, there's probably, if you listen to it, there's probably a really good reason why they're resistant. Um, either it doesn't resonate with them um, or it's like, don't tell me how to parent, which I think every person should say, don't tell me how to parent. I think that the information that we put out there should simply serve as like, uh, you know, get parents thinking and get them. But ultimately I want them to come to their own decisions. I want them to come to their own, like, And so I think anybody should, like, it's such a normal reaction to reject somebody telling you how to do something, Um, you know? So I think that, you know, whatever, there can be so many reasons why. And I think that it needs to be done, you know, very carefully and very gently. And also, yeah, there could be so many reasons why, you know, the husbands are disinterested. Who knows, you know? Um, But I think that it's it's really about being understanding of that and um, not thinking like, oh, judging them, I guess, for it. I think when we start judging and thinking like, oh, they're just this or they're just that and they're just not interested. I mean, it, it, first of all, then, you're, you know, I talk about seeing the goodness in children all the time, like the yeah. attention behind their behavior. I believe it's the same for all humans, not just children. Um, and so I think that there's no way to, there's no path to, um, you know, path to getting a spouse on board by judging the hell out of them. So, um, yeah, I was, I, we discussed this briefly in our first time we, we, we talked to how, it's seen, I have this theory that there's a a masculine versus feminine role, and you are particularly an unconditional parenting coach. And I had quoted that it says Yitzchak loved uh, Asav because side repeat because he had trappings in his mouth, and then it says Rivka loved uh, loved Yaakov, and it didn't give any key, didn't give any because. And my theory, and then also we see repeatedly God seemingly like if you do this you will be to me a, a certain a, 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 a revered and glorified nation if you do x y and z you will get um you you will be provided for so my theory is like this masculine energy is conditional there is a certain amount of like we're here to push you challenge you and be demanding versus the mom which almost needs to be like unconditional loving no matter what and so I think a lot of the parenting coaching now is all about this unconditional love, unconditional, and men are all about conditions. Like, I don't even see, like, I, like, like my dad wasn't unconditional, like, and I don't resent that. I resent my mom's to the degree of what she was conditional, that I do, but I don't resent my dad's, like, uh, like, conditional, like, I, I appreciate it, I get it, I'm conditional, um, and... Yeah, I, I, I see that as a point of contention. Like, personally, like, this, like, unconditional love is dismissible. Like, almost, uh, Dennis Prager is very, like, funnily, like, hated for his, he's against unconditional love. He thinks, like, that's a ridiculous state. Um, 
I I argue with him, and you know, obviously I I don't have never been able to talk to him, but it, I think love should be unconditional. But I think re, like there are conditions, like we are conditional human beings. Like there's a, you can't hide it. Like back to the beginning of our conversation, where the parent is trying to be like like a stoic and blank slate, and then and then talk in one way, and their body's uh, saying something totally different. Like you, like I don't know, like. Yeah, what what do you, what does being unconditional in parenting mean to you? Yeah. Like, how does how do, how do you, yeah, 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 yeah. I I totally hear you, and I think that if we think of unconditional as being like totally fine with everything and like nothing ever bothers us, and like we're not going to be like, well, if you do this, then I don't feel like I want to do that or whatever. I, to me, that's not what unconditional love means. I actually, to be honest, I I I'm okay. First, I just want to say that I'm more about respect, not more. No, sorry, I, equally for me, like my message is, mo is, is uh, like I don't really use the word unconditional love so much. I actually talk much more about respect, respect children. That's like a lot of my message. I just want us to respect them as full, whole humans. So it's a lot about that now. But I do believe in unconditional love. But I think that it's 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 exactly what Dr. Gordon Newfield said. It's more that the relationship is greater than anything else, meaning even though you'll do this and it will bother me or you'll do that and I'll be upset about it or I don't like that you do this or because you do this and I'll do that. Even with all those things, with all that conditionality, above all that, there is still a relationship that you and I have that will never be broken. Do you understand? That to me is what it means. To me, to me, when, when a parent says like, I can't have anything to do with you anymore, mm -hmm. that's conditional love. Right. Or I, I conditions in your relationship. What do you say? Right, like just like uh, if I could get rid of you, I would. Like that type of attitude. Yeah, yeah. And some parents literally do do that. They literally do. They're like, there are certain things that if you do them, I will have nothing to do with you anymore. That to me is conditional love, and that's very terrifying. I think for any child to experience, it's like, wow, the people who supposedly are closest to me and love me most, who are the who are the most supportive, supposed to be. Um, like there's something that can actually threaten my very relationship with them that can make me completely disconnect they, them disconnect from me and not want to have anything to do with me. So, so it's not about like in the relationship having those conditions or whatever, but I think it's that it's, it's like, right. You were saying how like Yitzhak was saying that like he loves him because of these things. I think that makes sense to, to, to say, I mean, I love that with a mother, it was more, you know, unconditional where there was like not reliant on anything, but I imagine that. I mean, you say clearly, it's like never disconnected from Asav. He never, even though he did terrible things, he never was like, I have nothing to do with you. I mean, he still wanted to give him brachos. Like, right? Well, we can argue that he didn't know, right? I think some people say that. Yeah, that that is the argument that he, I mean, the the reading of Kitsaid Bepiv is whether or not it's be, it's because Asav manipulated him um, into believing certain things about him, or it's uh, that's why he loved him, or it's because... He actually admired this trait of being uh, cunning with his his ability to speak. To speak, uh, uh, oh, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But I imagine that like he didn't right. Like he always knew his son was like not you know whatever it was, or maybe it was Rifka who knew that. But I think that saying that like oh he had nothing to do with him anymore that to me is like conditional love. Right, and I guess what like what like how do we teach a kid that no means no? Like if no. If no doesn't have consequences attached to it, like real consequences, ones that would be bothersome, like like it, it doesn't really mean anything. I feel like if someone says like, "Can you have this?" and like, "Can I have this?" and I say no, and then they go ahead and take it anyways, and then there's nothing I could do about it. Like, what? Like, how do we teach a kid first off both so they when they say no, it actually means no, but then also when we say no, it means no. Like, what if we don't? punish and we don't scold and we don't and we don't yeah. um use behaviorist tactics to train our kids like what consequences do we have yeah so so for me the like this question relies on the i guess assumption that humans children our children specifically would um they have zero motivation to act from a place of care and compassion and um values um right that's the assumption because it's like obviously if there's no consequence then what then of course they would do it 
And that's what's missing for me is that like I actually see my children as very caring, very compassionate, very value, like people full humans who do have values. Now, of course, they're when they're little, they're still developing those, et cetera. But but they're born with that. And so for me, it's about speaking to that part of my child rather than giving a consequence. Now, I'm not saying, by the way, in some situations, yeah, like you're not able to reach the child. And then you do have to, let's say, give a consequence for protection to make sure that whatever. But really, for me, I find that it's really it has never been necessary in my own parenting with my own children because I've always spoken to their heart or I've tried to. Um, and and then they got it and they understood the value and they stood like, of course, I also wouldn't want to be hurt or whatever it is. And so there was no need for a consequence because, see, the, the consequence isn't like you said, it's, a, and it's an attempt to be like, make it not worthwhile for them to do it, so to speak. Right. Be like, oh, they, and it's like I can make it not worthwhile in quotes because I don't know if that by, by them just understanding the impact or by them touching the care that they have inside of them. And I think that's much more in, impactful in a way. Um, than just giving consequences. I see consequences as actually a lot less impactful. Right. And would you say there's a difference between, like always we, as, I mean, God-fearing or listening to the dogma that there's always a reward and punishment. We're always talking about reward and punishment. And for me, I, I mean, I was, my understanding of reward and punishment is not at all reward and punishment. It is actually the natural consequences of your behaviors there are positive and negative ones and Great. essentially you get to and what we and whenever we hear scharvonish all that's really happening is that it's like you will get to experience the consequences of your behaviors if they are positive behaviors you will experience it um both socially and metaphysically and what on whatever level you're going to think about it whatever yeah. exactly and it's so I, I mean, I, I see it. It's just as like as a parent, like I value my daughter's like rebelliousness and her disagreeableness. And like I like but then again, it's like such a pain in the ass. Like like so like it's like a holding like two. like I get a certain amount of pleasure when she is snappy and like a little bit like manipulative. Like there's like a certain like pleasure I get with her ability to f like figure out how to get what she wants and not just be a sheep and not just listen to the rules and not just listen to whatever she's told. Um, but I would love it if like she could do that with everybody but me, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, uh, like that's what I want. And g just also something this has uh, been like on my mind, on my wife's mind a lot. She seems to be very sensitive to it. There's all like in the last five years, 10 years, this awareness of abuse, uh, sexual abuse uh, towards children and like, if we look at the statistics, the majority of people are abused by their own siblings. Like that's the craziest statistic. But oh, so we had like, I don't know, we're it's Pesach and we're going away and like all like my wife sending me all these clips and videos and like of like all these like things that like, yeah, like, like t teach your kid this and don't let them be around people with this age. And there's all this anxiety and stress around the potential um, for abuse. Um, and then we've also attacked on top of that, this like adults, like who just like kids and would love to be like, who love kids, can't show their love to kids, can't be affectionate to kids. And I feel like kids used to be able to get a hug from a teacher. Now that would be unheard of to get a hug if they needed a hug. And so I'm wondering if our fear of trauma or fear of them being abused, God forbid, has almost created an entire world that like is less ideal so like they can no longer receive any physical affection they can no longer like we have to be anxious all the time uh how do how do we like how do we deal with this like i grew i mean i guess i grew i grew up my mom like sitting me down being like if anybody ever told you to like like that like they would hurt you or they would or they would hurt mommy daddy or like like then you come to us because we'll, we'll we'll be there for you. So there's always an awareness, and obviously don't take it, don't take candy from the guy in the car. But in a world where it's essentially seems to be almost impossible to avoid, like the first time it ever happens, like you, like you, the people who abuse aren't always monsters. They're not always. They're often the person you would least expect to be the abuser. So when that's the reality, is it worth all the fear about like? the dangerous evil man who's hanging out or should we like put less emphasis on, on this yeah, topic? I'm probably not the right person. 
I'm following on the right person to ask this question just because I have so, I, I'm very biased because I have very close relatives who were abused, sexually abused. Um, and so for me, it's like such a, it's such a reality in my mind. And, and for me, like all the effort that I put into avoiding, uh, to, to like trying to ensure my children are not being sexually abused is like 1000% worth it because I see the impact of it. And so, yeah, I, I'm like, okay, so the, so everyone's a little bit anxious. It's fine, you know? Uh, but I will say one thing that I, I think that could be tweaked. I Meaning, like, if everyone get, everyone's a little bit anxious when they get together for Pesach and they're a little bit like on top of their kids and keep checking on them and make sure that they sleep in the same room as them. I'm like, I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. I don't think it's that going to damage anyone. I think the damage of sexual abuse is far worse. But I do think what you're saying about physical affection, like a teacher feeling like they can't hug a student, I think that that's where, like, it's for me, it's like the same parallel between like with a parent thinking that they can't show any emotion. It's like we, we're trying to get something, but we've we're, our, our strategies are not that great. Where I think it's more about the teacher asking consent from the student and respecting what they say. So that to me, I think we, it, for me, I, I would love if we move towards a teacher, yes, being able to show affection, but asking the child first, is it okay? I want to give you a hug. Is that okay? And then the child feeling like they can say yes or no, and then respecting that no without any sort of guilt or whatever. And that to me, I think is the ideal, not just like, oh, we're just going to avoid it all together then. Like same as a parent being like, I'm just going to avoid all my, you know, unpleasant emotions all together with my child because they're way too scary. It's like, no, actually there's a way to, uh, to navigate it that you understand. So I can see that as probably being more ideal. Right. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's, yeah, it's, I don't know. I see it as like, I'm even myself, like the person who gives kids candy i'm i'm just always skeptical i'm gonna be skeptical of you like it's just and they might just genuinely love kids and want to have give them sweets uh it's i was i was listening to ellie nash on the mislabeled podcast and he was basically saying that the for like he said the different for he was talking about from his personal experience because he was sexually abused from the ages of 10 to 14 years old by another teenager um a couple years older than him and he was saying how that I mean, it was a pretty radical statement that the abuse in it of itself, like he like said, it was, it was more the trauma, the, the, in the, in the, the, the trauma of the abuse, almost the, it was what happened after and the inability to come to the parent and talk to them and holding it in for 15 years, that was more traumatic and more detrimental than the, like the abuse itself. And he was saying like you basically that first encounter he's like i don't know how to tell you how to uh, avoid the first time because you you could be as protective as you could possibly imagine and then it's the person that you respected and loved and allowed your kid to be with the most that ends up doing it but it's creating like this radical like safety that the kid could come to you because like if god forbid it happens like i mean first off i'm 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 gonna i'm gonna hopefully i wouldn't end up in prison uh afterwards like but there's but even that like even saying something like that supposedly is like your kid can't even hear that because they might really like the person who is is touching them and they wouldn't want them to get hurt so it's i don't know like i i still i mean this is like the biggest fear in the entire world uh, i mean having a daughter and having like i can't imagine something worse happening um yeah. but i don't know i just i don't i don't know how like I don't know it's just yeah I guess like I guess like what you said like ha- making sure the do- and the kid knows okay if you don't want to hug grandpa you don't have to hug grandpa if you don't want to hug your uncle you don't have to and you could say no and and no means no exactly. I mean yeah and I think that what you said having that and, and now we're going full circle now we're going literally full circle to the beginning okay you said this and I love what this person said because a lot of trauma victims will say that like the fact that they couldn't share with somebody else was almost worse more traumatic and and why? Why couldn't they share with their parents? Because their parents maybe didn't talk with them openly about sex and sexuality. Um, their parent maybe didn't punish them a lot, um, got angry at them a lot, and they didn't feel safe to come to their parent with things. So going for a circle, that is why, well, one of the reasons why um, I do believe in uh, putting a big emphasis on being uh, safe for our children and not punishing them every right, left, and center and, you know, really, yes, having conversations and talking to them, also talking to them about sex and sexuality. I just did a live on that the other day with Elisha Valis. I, I think that's really important. Um, so children know that, like, you're someone who can talk, come, but also just that so they feel safe, that they're not going to get in trouble. I I know for myself that there were times that I was in, I was in trouble, but I was afraid to tell adults in my life because I, 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 I thought I would get in trouble. 
um, my child herself um, was in trouble at school and she said I was scared to tell my teacher because I thought she would punish me. So I you clearly see, I clearly see the impact of that, but she wasn't afraid to tell me because she knows I don't punish. So there's a certain safety in that. There's a certain safety in a child knowing my parent will not do that to me. And so I, I really, that's one of the really, the big reasons why I believe in creating that sort of re a relationship where, yeah, there is a level of safety. And how do you, like, I know my, my daughter, I, they, she makes up, like, she makes up stories about what happens with her friends and how she got a toy that isn't like hers. And like, and this Very idea of like, like, yeah, you look at the, the yeah, the, uh, like, just like the, now in the last few years, the, uh, what was the movement called? Uh, like, I don't believe all women, like, and every claim is believed. And you want to, like, on the one hand, I hear it, like, it's like, oh, I'll always believe you. I'll always, like, whatever you say, like, I'll believe you. And like, versus like, okay, let's deal with reality. Like, as soon as someone knows that they could get somebody else in trouble by saying something like, how, like, 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 what do you, how do you, what do you communicate to your kids that's both like, always, like, I don't, I won't always believe you no matter what about everything, but you can always come to me. Like, how, like, how, what, yeah. what linguists, like, what do you say? Like, I, I'm trying to find the words to say in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. So my children know I always believe them in the sense that I believe that they believe what they're saying. I always tell them that. Like, sometimes I'm like, I'm not sure if that actually is what happened, but I believe that you believe that, you know? Meaning, like, I'll never, like, doubt that you're, yeah, so in, in that way. And sometimes they get actually annoyed about that because they're like, no, that is actually what happened, <laughs> you know. And I'm like, I, I, I know I believe that like, when you're saying you really believe that. I just don't know because I wasn't there, so I just can't say for certain, you know. But I, I don't think it's necessary. I'm thinking overall, have I ever told my children, like, if you come to me, I'll for sure believe you. Or if I do, I don't know. I've never said that. I think it's more about overall the kind of relationship I try to create. Um, and the, the the feeling they get from me is that my parent really will take what I'm saying seriously and they're not going to like be skeptical of everything or not going to like be like shove it under the rug, especially if, you know, they communicate in a way where like they're afraid to say it or it's a vulnerable for them. Like then I'm for sure believing them, you know. Right. And do you like how. How have you guided your kids to appreciate the value of speaking truth and, and, and communicating truthfully and honestly uh, and how. How, how have you effectively educated your kids with that trick? Yeah, so first of all, like four-year-olds, it's like very age appropriate for them to like make up stories. Like, and it's not even like a, an attempt to deceive you. It's really more, I mean, it could be a combination of that, but it's really a lot has to do with their imagination. They're super imaginative at that age. Imagination is like, I don't know if you remember what like it was like when you were a child. Sometimes I forget, but sometimes I remember and I'm like, wow, imagination was literally reality. Like if I imagined that, like, I remember I made up stories all day long, even when I was older and I didn't, it wasn't to deceive. It was just like it was so fun because like I, I just thought it like could be true and why wouldn't wouldn't it be fun to say it as if it was true you know um so yeah like I think that it's just so common for children to say and so for me when children say those kinds of things I would be like oh my gosh wouldn't it be fun if that was true I try to correct them in a way where it's not like I'm understanding their intention in saying that or whatever or sometimes they're trying to protect themselves they'll say like yeah like I've said this many times my kids where I said like yeah like is it like are you worried that if you say what really happened that someone's going to be mad and so I, I try to really address that first to then like give them the courage or the, you know, the safety to then yes, say the truth. Um, that's really what I try to do. Awesome. And uh, um, I think we probably getting close to when we should get going. But yeah, what do you, I, this is one last, one last question uh, for a, a lot of the single people listening who uh, are not yet parents and don't feel like they're ready to become parents yet or they're not uh, prepared or they should wait for some type of financial goal or emotional goal or whatever it is. Uh, is there... Um, my belief is that you'll never really be ready to be a parent until like you're a parent. Like, And no matter how much you prepare, uh, you're still not going to be prepared. Is there a... Is there like a rule of thumb um, that is like, hey, you're ready to have kids or you're not ready to have kids? Mm, that's a really good question. Yeah. Like, I don't think you're ever ready. And it's always like the things you need to learn, you'll only learn by being a parent kind of thing. You know, these, that's why like I'd be, a, I'll be a much better parent once I'm like already, my children, children are fully grown because I've already learned because now I've done it, you know, um, but now it's too late. 
Um, so, but yeah, is there like an indicator sort of to know? I think I'd probably say, and this might sound funny, but this is immediately what comes to mind, is I think that um, being comfortable with your own feelings, um, your own emotions, being able to express them, being able to sit with them. I think that like that has many implications in a lot of ways in parenting. So I think that that probably, if you're able to, um, then I think you've got a head start. All right. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me a second time, even after the first time uh, had its technical difficulties and child difficulties. Uh, where, where, where would you like people to find you? Uh, they work at where, where would you like people to, if you could guide anybody who's listening, he's like, okay, I like Blamey and I, um, I'd like to see more and maybe where, where would you send them? Yeah. So, um, first of all, I want to say it was really my pleasure. And I so, so enjoyed this interview. I don't think like the questions, many things you've asked, I don't think I've ever been asked those things. And I love, I love that. I love when it's like new questions and things I haven't been asked before. So thank you for that. And, um, people can find me. Okay. So I have a website, bleemyheller.com and maybe you can put it in the show notes. And then I also, I'm on Instagram, like you mentioned, my handle is unconditional parenting, but you can also find that on my website, meaning I have my, um, Instagram there, uh, link there. I also, for people who don't have Instagram, I'm on WhatsApp. I share my, my posts to my WhatsApp status. And I think really, if you want to reach me, everything is there, like my access to my email or whatever. I do share like more or less, I try to share daily posts, like I said, not to tell people what to do, <laughs> um, but to for them to hear different perspectives, to consider it and to do what they, they want with it, really. Um, I, I, I really, I encourage, I, I, I welcome resistance. I welcome um, all of that because like I said, I think there's something valuable and I think there's an important message behind resistance and I believe a parent should listen to that. Um, they shouldn't just absorb somebody else's information, hook, line, and sinker. Um, everybody should view it through their own lens and take it as it makes sense to them.